You got a Bible? Yes. We uh, were talking about last week, dealing with some other things, and uh, uh, started starting in again part two, the sins of commission. We dealt with the sins of omission, and we finished up talking about that you are the tabernacle. You are the temple of the living God. We talked about that you've been bought with a price. You're not your own. You have been purchased. The Bible says in the book of Corinthians that you are God's husbandry. Now, we don't use the word husbandry a lot. It says you are God's husbandry. Well, if you look in other translations, you'll find other words for the word husbandry. Uh, You'll find the word garden. You'll find the word farm. You'll find the word tillage. But you are God's husbandry. You are God's tillage. You are God's farm. My favorite is you are God's garden. And we love beautiful things to grow in the garden. Amen. We love beautiful things to grow there. So if you are God's garden, then you're not your own garden. I'll say that again. If you are God's garden, then you are not your own garden. Now, I've never, I haven't gardened since I've been on my own until this year. I gardened in uh, eight five-gallon buckets. I fixed I fix, uh, six buckets, had tomatoes in it. And two buckets had cayenne peppers in it. So uh, I ventured out in gardening in eight five-gallon buckets. Successful on one side, learning curve on another. But in my buckets, I wanted what I wanted. I wanted tomatoes. I wanted slicers. And I had one plant just for, you know, little cherry tomatoes that we could have for salads. But these were my tomatoes. That means you had no right to come and interfere with my buckets. You wouldn't have room to get anything else in it anyway. But they were my buckets. All right. It's amazing when you start planting, everybody has an opinion what you ought to put in your bucket. Oh, did you plant this? No, I planted some celebrities. Oh, you shouldn't have planted celebrities. You should have planted this kind. I planted cayenne. Why, why, why cayenne? Why not habaneros? Why, 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 why not jalapenos? Why, why, why do you plant cayenne? Because I like cayenne. I love them. And uh, I get them right before they turn red. And I'll lay three or four out next to my plate and just eat them down and smile. I enjoy it. Enjoy it. I met some pastors down at the Wings, etc., for lunch on a Tuesday a month ago, and I grabbed me three cayennes in a Ziploc baggie, and along with my hamburger, I had me some cayenne. Well, why don't you use this kind of, I've had people ask me, why didn't you plant this kind of pepper? Because, read my lips, I like, not like jalapenos, but not like I like cayenne. I like cayenne for a certain reason. I love the flavor, and I love it that it's a natural herb. It's good for your body. I like a cayenne. So since they're my, since it's my bucket and it's my choice, how many knows I get to pick what I want? Regardless of your opinions. So you are God's garden. You've been purchased with a price. And a lot of people have an opinion on what ought to be in that garden. But what's in that garden should be what God says ought to be in that garden. And what should be in that garden is what the Bible declares ought to be in your life. God doesn't expect weeds of strife in that garden. He doesn't want you to grow strife. He doesn't want you to grow contention. He doesn't want you to grow any of that. He wants you to have everything that pertains to life and godliness growing in that garden. So this is the same story. Matter of fact, I'm compelled to read that. I wasn't planned. Now I'm compelled. Your looks compelled me. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Yeah. yeah, it wasn't even my text, but you compelled me. All right. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I'm going to start in verse 1, see if it aggravate anybody. <clears throat> verse 1. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people. Well, I I know he's feeling. There's times I couldn't speak to people like they were spiritual. You know, people that really act really, really holy and spiritual. 
I uh, keep an eyeball on them. Because sometimes the act is better than the performance. The act is better than the reality. So uh, you don't have to act to be spiritual. You just live the life of God. Amen. That's just a little hint. I can't speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal. As to babes in Christ. Now, somebody busted on me last week when I said, it ain't, it's, not, it's none of you that I'm speaking to. It's everybody streaming. Well, I got a couple of texts from those people streaming. Let me know that it wasn't them. So it's not everybody that's streaming. Just most of you. No, I'm kidding. So it's not everybody that's streaming. But as babes in Christ. So he says to the church of Corinth, say the church. He's not speaking to the world. He's speaking to the church. Say the church. Paul said to the church that he planted. He was the apostle. He was the father. And he said, I can't speak to you like I've speak to spiritual people, but I'm going to have to speak to you like you're still carnal, like you're still a baby in Christ. (gasps) How could you dare call us babies and carnal? Well, because Paul said you acted that way and he's going to explain to them why they were. And it's going to apply to what I'm talking about tonight uh, since you compelled me. I fed you with milk and not with solid food or not with meat. For unto now you were not able to receive it. And even now you are still not able. I mean, he just didn't slap them once. He didn't give them time to turn the other cheek before he hit the other side. For you are still carnal. For whereas there are underlying these, so you'll stay away from them. Envy. Strive and divisions among you. How many knows these things ought not be numbered in the church? Can I get a better head nod? These things ought not be numbered in the church. You know, it takes just as much. It, it's, it doesn't take any more effort uh, to frown than it does to smile or smile it does to frown. Matter of fact, I haven't studied and I'm not... I don't study the anatomy and your muscles in your face, but it said it takes, I heard somebody say it takes more muscles to frown than it does to smile. So I don't know what it is. So if that's the case, it's easier just to act like you can live by faith and have a good time than it is to look like somebody just kicked your puppy. Amen. Divisions among you. Are you not carnal and be and behaving like mere men? For when one says, I'm of Paul, and another says, I'm of Apollos, are you not carnal? Imagine, imagine that I have, so you have Paul, the founder of the church, the pastor. He had a rough way to go with this church. You realize he had to tell this church that he poured his life into, and they were doubting his apostleship. That would be like me going to Kenya, and all of a sudden coming to Peace Church Kenya with a doubt my authority. What do you mean doubt my authority? It was the gift of God and it was the leadership of the Holy Ghost in us that helped get us here. Why are you going to try to doubt it now? And they were, and they doubted it. And Paul had to tell them others can doubt, but you have no right to doubt because you're the very proof or the seal of my apostleship. You're the very proof of it. They were tough, man. Can you imagine The church of Macedonia had to provide for his needs because they didn't feel he was worthy to be supported. Thank God I didn't pastor that bunch. Thank God I pastored covenant of peace. Can I get a better amen? I've never struggled to fulfill the will of God because of this church knows how to support. Thank God. But this is his struggles. And all of a sudden he has a preaching partner named Apollos. And now there's divisions. Well, I'm really a Paul. Well, I'm really of Apollos. Who is Paul? Who is Apollos? But we're both ministers of the gospel. One sowed, one watered. But it's God that makes the seed to grow. Come on. It'd be terrible if somebody say, well, I'm of Harbaugh, and well, I'm still of Rothwell. And I'm still of this one. I'm still of that one. That'd just be crazy, wouldn't it? That'd be crazy. So let's just read on. I'll tell you what he said. Who is Paul? 
And who is Apollos, but ministers to whom you believed, as the Lord gave to each one. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Now he who plants and he who waters are what? One. Are we in this together? We're all in this together. I love when we all said this biblically. After 2020, that phrase kind of got to me a little bit. We're all in this together. Stay inside. Anyway. Now he who plants and who who waters are one. And each one will receive his own reward according to his own what? Uh Uh-huh. Now wait. You're not going to receive your reward according to my labor. Let's get this right. You're not going to receive your reward according to my prayer life. You're not going to receive your reward according to Don's prayer life. You're not going to receive your reward according to, you know, anybody else. You're not going to receive your reward according to anybody else. You're not going to receive your reward according to the way that we discipline ourselves. You have to do it yourself. Come on. Now, what one person walks in may benefit you, but there's something about you have to do something. Well, it's not about works. Well, it is here. It's not about the works of right. It's not about the works of righteousness. We know that's sealed. But here, each one who receives his own reward according to his what? That's like seed time and harvest. Don't expect a harvest unless you have a seed. You know, like it or don't like it, same way on the internet, people may not like the late great man Oral Roberts. As people called him a liar, called him this, called him that, made, made accusations about him that didn't exist. And uh, he was building what they called back then the city of faith. Even in the 80s, I'd visit the city of faith and he had a wonderful thing in there. And uh, Oral Roberts had multi-millions. He wanted to, he wanted to educate people in healing. He was so strong in natural healing, he wanted to build City of Faith and train doctors and have a place where doctors could go around the world and help people. And this was going to be the City of Faith. It was a massive, massive hospital. It's like a big research center now. But uh, he built that, and all of a sudden, all of his money just dried up, dried up, dried up. Now, this was years before I even knew City of Faith or Tulsa uh, before I got there. So I got the testimony, you know, in the 80s about this and he was just money just dried up money just quit coming in money just kept kept coming just quit coming in and he went to the prayer tower there no roberts university if you've never been on that university it's a beautiful campus and they have this prayer tower you can go online and pull up or roberts university prayer tower it's a beautiful architectural structure and i've been in it several times and him and richard went in his prayer tower and they were praying about why the money had stopped And he said, the word of the Lord came to him and said, you have withdrawn beyond your deposit. You have withdrawn beyond your deposit. God is, God doesn't have limits, but it's like anything else. Seed sown, harvest comes. Even if he got a hundred... Fold return, he had withdrawn beyond it. Now, this is him telling it. This is not me trying to figure out what he's saying. He says, the Lord says, stop praying. You have overdrawn your deposits. He told Richard, stop, stop. Ain't there anything, no sense praying. He said, what is the most valuable thing we have in this ministry right now? His son said, it's simple. It's our Learjet. That gets you everywhere. He said, sell it today. He said, no, I was wrong. Give it away today. Sow it today. Sow it today. And he called a ministry and said, uh, we want to see you. And they came to see him and it says, uh, we're giving you, we're sowing. The greatest asset we have in this ministry is this jet airplane into your ministry. Sowing it, lock, stock, and barrel. As soon as the airplane was signed over and the other 
ministry took possession of it. Money just kept coming back in until the place was built. He overwithdrew his deposit. So, you know, people are saying, I keep believing God for this. I'm believing God for this. I'm believing God for that. I've often wondered, because then when that happened, I started really searching into it about deposits and withdrawals. I started preaching about it. Strong in the 90s. And I see people struggling to get money. And I've often wondered, where's their heavenly account? Where's their heavenly account? Where is the deposit withdrawal ratio? Am I making sense? That's why I've chose every chance I get. Sow something. The Bible says you don't know if it's going to come back in the morning. You sow morning and evening because you don't know which one's going to bring the harvest. You sow morning and evening because you don't know which one's going to do it. And that's what you do. You sow that. You sow that. Yesterday I was with somebody and they were, they were believing God for something. And they'll probably be here. And I said, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to make a commitment to that. And I told him exactly. But the point is, the whole return, why I continue to give, you know, in the fashion we give out of this church in my heart is because stories like that fixed my wagon a long time ago before my wagon got broke. Yes. It's best to get your wagon fixed before your wagon's broke. That's right. That's right. And I realized that I always want to be able to go approach the throne of grace and be able to withdraw from that account because we're always putting something in it. Amen. I'm not talking about LCMB and I'm not talking about U.S. Bank. I'm not talking about Twins, uh, Twin Valley Bank. I'm, I'm not talking about Chase. I'm talking about you've got to be able to withdraw from that heavenly account. See, and that's another teaching. A lot of people know how to, how to sow. They don't know how to receive. There's a faith you sow in and there's a faith you receive from. And when you work them together... It's a beautiful thing. And God's got a way to do that. And when I, in 1996, when, when, when I had that encounter with God about going full time and stopping everything, when I had nothing coming in, nothing, nothing, literally nothing, Angel sat right there at the parking lot in her white Grand Prix and said, you're going to go back to work. You are, you are going under. You, and uh, I done told her that if I disobey God this time, I'll, I'll ne- I told her this was so strong on me because I, I, I said no and resisted for so long. My exact words to her. If I do this, if I don't obey God now, I'll never live to be an old man. I told her that. And I said, I will not go back. And uh, we were not married yet. And I just kept believing. And barely, you know, breaking even would have been a supernatural thing at first. There was no breaking even. But I learned over a period of time to allow, to allow, and get to revelation upon it, upon it, upon it. So you've got to start somewhere. You've got to start somewhere. Every time I've ever had to go before God to, to talk to him about my need, he's always put them in my heart regarding my seed. He's always put in there regarding my seed. So uh, it works. Seed time and harvest works. And somebody say, it doesn't work. It's working for you. You're sowing seeds of doubt and you're getting a harvest. Nothing. It all works. Someone says, well, I don't believe in healing. But don't, I wouldn't leave sleep over it. It's not going to take you, it's not going to hijack you. (laughs) Healing's not going to hijack you. You receive it when you what? Believe. If you don't believe in it, it's not going to force itself on you. I don't believe in the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Well, then most likely you don't have to worry about it. Because most people receive it, receive it by faith. Or have a heart open to receive it. So, we usually get what, what we desire. We usually get what we desire. But he says here, it says here, we all receive according to our labor. Now, if I don't get off this thing you compelled me to get into we'll never get to what i'm getting ready to go to but i think i'm helping somebody come on folks i'm telling you i've told the story so much that some stories i don't tell because i think people get tired of hearing it but when i came when i left for africa 
February the 27th and didn't come back to Ohio May the 2nd. That's a long time in Africa. And I was there. Didn't even tell Angel or anybody the encounter I had with God. I laid on a cold floor, concrete floor, and said, I'm not going to eat or drink until I get to understand what God spoke to me after that crusade in the city of Voy. When he told me I hadn't taken up my cross. And when he dealt with me about the cross being a total sold out commitment, not just being born again. When I arrived back into this town, I literally, in that one little bedroom apartment down a catacorner corner from Marsh, uh, store down there, whatever it was now, it's empty now is what it is. But I took the clocks off the wall, covered up what I didn't have. And I said, I'm not going I'm not, I won't leave this house and I'll never survive until I learn how to walk by faith. I preached it. I preached it. People has had me come in to do seminars on it, but I couldn't get this to work. And I knew it was God's will for it to work. And I just stayed after it. It took those four books. Remember what faith is, the real faith, right and wrong thinking, how to turn your faith loose. Those four books revolutionized my life. I had them in Rhema. I'm talking about, I'm talking about 10 years out of school. And I went back to those books and said, I'll learn to walk by faith all over again. And all of May, no place to preach, no money. Into June, my dad was a stroke patient. He would fall and trip. I took him over to the store and dropped him off. He was in there for a long time. And uh, I said, I better go check on him. He may have fallen. And they don't know anybody's out here. I worked in that store in high school. I knew the ladies that worked in the offices. That one yelled out and said, hey, Ken, when did you get back from Africa? I said, you know, about f- four weeks ago. She said, I've been, l- I've been looking for you. The Lord put on my heart to give you something. Gave me $78. I'll never forget it. Not 100 78 I took the tithe out. And it was just the right amount I needed to pay my electric bill. That's how this thing worked, man. All of June, all of July, into August. And uh, in August, I went out to get in my car, and it wouldn't start. The starter was out. Remember that backslid car I talk about? That I didn't want to pull up in Jack Cobb's driveway? The one I picked up, Angel, and took her out on our first date? <laughs> Inside, outside looked good. I kept it polished, baby oil and all. But it wasn't much, man. But I took care of it. I took care of it. And... Uh, there used to be a parts store down there on Cherry Street called Rotafelds. I called Rotafelds Parts, and I got a, a price on what a starter was going to be. It's going to be $99. And I've been reading that book for over a month, almost into two months. What faith is, the real faith, right and wrong thinking, I'll turn your faith loose. I mean, I'm telling you, I'm energized, praying in the Holy Ghost, not leaving the house, just only what I had to. And I said that day, Father, I stand here according to your word based upon this. If I had a place to preach, which I don't, but if someone would call me tomorrow, I couldn't go preach. I don't even have a starter. I couldn't even, get, I couldn't even go. If I was called to preach, I couldn't go. And I said, I believe I receive. It was, it was earlier that day. I did. I believe I received that starter, $100 by that starter. Afternoon passed, evening passed, night passed. I went to bed that night, but it was something different than ever before. I didn't go to bed feeling like I was dejected, like I missed God. There was something in me still bubbling. And the next morning, I knock on the door about nine o'clock and uh, answer the door. And the, and the person said, man, I had all intention to get here yesterday. But if anything could have gotten away, it gotten away. But the Lord told me to bring you this and he gave me a hundred dollar bill. And I just shouted. And I told people from that point on, my new walk of faith started with a starter. And that's a fact. And from that point on, I kept climbing. I kept climbing. In the September of that year, September of that year, all of May, all of June, all of July, all of August, the end of September that year, supernaturally, God brought me completely out of that debt and set my feet on a level ground. Still not much money, but I wasn't paying everything in interest. I wasn't paying everything in interest. And from that point on, I've been very cautious about 
this deposit and return deal. I've been very cautious about it. And uh, there's times it's been a struggle. But I know the only resistor is the devil. If I do my part, I can't sit there and be convicted like, well, you haven't been given. You've stole the tithe. You, you don't give. You don't sow. No. I can stand there with freedom knowing that if I fight through this warfare, this pressure, because I've told people for years, you don't have a marriage problem. You don't have a money problem. You don't have a relationship problem. You have a pressure problem. If you learn to beat the pressure by the word of God, the pressure will cease and the flow will begin. Amen. But if you don't do what you need to do, then the pressure will become real, real, real game stopping pressure. Is this all right? So preaching one is one thing. Knowing where I started and what I did to make it work and seeing it work all these years is what changed. And I know it works. I know the desire that it works. But the truth is God has shows no partiality. Folks, I told Angel yesterday, just yesterday, I said, I just don't, I couldn't see it. One time I could not see, I could not fathom how I could do what I'm doing. And I know sometimes he feels this way on what he wants to do. It's hard for him to fathom. But I tell you by the goodness of God, I could not fathom. I could not fathom doing it. But one day things started clicking together. And I didn't quit and you're not quitting. And nobody quits. And we just keep going. And we keep going. When you have a dream to make ministry your life, this is where you live by it, and you don't seem to be able to get there, something starts happening called hope deferred. But we do not let our heart get sick. We do not let our heart get sick. And we are going, every one of us has the right to fulfill the will of God. Now, it's not about compensated, not compensated. It's still about fulfilling the will of God for our life. Amen. The will of God for our life. I'm saying that to Don because we've had our conversations, you know, and what's going on. And, uh, uh, people's hearts, people's hearts yearn for God. So don't ever give up on your dream. Don't ever give up on your dream. What's made this church strong is because we got strong people in it that want to walk with God and see things work. So don't give up on it. I was just going to read these verses real quick. But you compelled me. Let's go back to verse 8. Now he who plants and who who waters. Are what? And each one receives his own. According to his own. For we are God's fellow workers. Now the new King James. Says you are God's field. Some of your Bible says you are God's what? Husbandry. This says you are God's field. You are God's husbandry. You are God's building. So the word field in another one is you are God's garden. So God has a say so of what goes in your garden. That means he doesn't want you to allow the world to plant in there. He doesn't want you to allow carnal people to plant in that garden. You keep that garden pure. You want know what I love about growing tomatoes out of buckets? I didn't have to weed it. Because I bought all new dirt. I bought, went to Brubaker's and bought real topsoil. And I went out there to that Crystal Creek and bought real planting soil. And when I, and the whole time, no weeds. No weeds. No weeds. <laughs> So you know what you got to do? You got to keep weeds out. You got to keep weeds of doubt. You got to keep weeds of strife out. You got to keep weeds of frustration out. You got to keep weeds out of the garden. You are God's garden. Now God's not going to weed. He's going to expect you to keep the weeds out. Okay? So he's made you the caretaker over his garden. Okay? He's going to make you the caretaker over his garden. But it's his garden. Don't forget. So that means you don't have a say so. You just work it. Oh, come on. It's got to be helping somebody. You don't have a say so. What's in it? You just work it. He has the say so. And as long as you let him say so, it's going to be a beautiful garden. It's going to be, people's going to say, man, I love what's growing in your life. 
hey, hey, I'm just a steward over what's God's. And I'm just going to be obedient to what's God's. Come on. Verse 10, according to the grace of God, which was given me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation. Another has built on it. But let everyone take heed how he, what? Builds upon it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which was laid, which is what? Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble, each one's work will be clear. For the day will be declared. For the, for, for the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test each one's work and what sort it is. So eventually, it's going to be tried and tested. So it's good to come out shining, come out and be right. Now, this is what Paul dealt with. He, he preached a sermon to a bunch of carnal people. I'm blessed. I get to preach a sermon tonight to people that are not carnal because you're here on Wednesday nights. Amen. They've said a long time ago, people come on Sunday morning just may like church. People come on Sunday night, you know, probably likes the pastor. But those come on Wednesday night, truly love God, I'd say. So, uh, but so you're, you're people that are really heart for God. So I love this book. And, uh, you could just keep going down like verse 14. If anyone's work, which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. So God's wants you. God wants you to receive the reward. Okay. Now, when you're looking at this, I started off by saying you are God's tabernacle. You've been bought with a price. And in doing this, being bought with a price and understanding what it is to live free in him and having clean hands and a pure heart because we want to build a sensitivity in us and become, become aware of what I call God conscious. To be more conscious of God than you are of anything else in your life. Have a God consciousness. But you know, some people have a flesh consciousness. They have a fear consciousness. They have a... Uh, Inferiority consciousness. But you got to become God conscious. You got to become aware of God. You got to become aware of God. I believe you can become so aware of God that God's here. That. Uh, and you can do this without being flaky. I was in a meeting and I'm not going to mention names now because. Uh, I was in a meeting in uh, Tulsa years ago at the Maybe Center, the big center down here on the Old Roberts campus. And it was a conference, so it wasn't, it wasn't there. And a certain powerful healing prophet evangelist guy was supposed to, he wasn't supposed to attend it. But uh, I heard this guy get up and tell it. He got up and spoke it because he told someone next to him. And the guy confirmed it. He got up and he said, uh, I just leaned to uh, so-and-so. was one of the big, well-known pastors in Tulsa. I, I said to him, uh, Brother so-and-so's here. He said, no, he isn't. He's not supposed to be here. He said, he's here. He says, uh, how do you know? He said, I walked with him for years. And anytime he's around, that anointing. I'm, I'm so familiar with that anointing on his life. When any time I've been with him in a room, that anointing, I'm so sensitive to his anointing. He's here. And uh, he said, well, he's not supposed to be here. And it wasn't long after that, they got up and said, you know, brother so-and-so, I'm supposed to be here, but he's here. We're going to come up and say a few words. And I'm thinking, oh, you want to be aware. If you can be aware of a, God, a man's anointing like that, how much more should we be conscious of God? Come on. I'm telling some stories I haven't told. But these things are real, man. This is real life. This is, this is what happens in uh, the anointing of God and the presence of God ought to be tangible to where we are sensitive to it. You know, some people, because the service is going well and say, you know, there was a great anointing in the house or this person is anointing, that person is anointing. Uh, even if you don't feel anything, God's, God's in the house. 
I had some relatives attending the church years ago, and this was way back. I mean, this must have been 26, 26, 27 years ago. And uh, I'd stop by and visit my parents, and they'd stop by, or I'd see them that day. And it seemed like for like three weeks in a row, uh, I'd say, well, how was church today? They went to a dominational church. And they said, oh, the church was good. The Holy Ghost. I said, uh, what did uh, what'd your pastor preach on? Oh, there wasn't no preaching. The Holy Ghost took over. There's no preaching. I said, that's great. It's happened where I've flown in it. And, uh, and then the next uh, week, I said, uh, what, what was service? What, what, you guys, uh, what, did, what was the sermon about today? Oh, there's no sermon. The Holy Ghost took over. And three weeks in a row, I asked a question. Has the Holy Ghost ever taken over in the Word? Because it's almost like we get this mentality, we can preach. But when the Holy Ghost wants to take over, there's no preaching. But I think the Holy Ghost can move in this. I think the Holy Ghost can take over in this. It'd be terrible to think that the only time the Holy Ghost takes over is when it's almost like preaching is man thing. But now God wants to hijack and he wants to take over. And when he takes over, there's no word. Let me tell you, the Bible is very clear. He exalts his word above his name. He will take over in the book. I think he did that tonight. Kind of feels that way a little bit. Come on. Say what happened Wednesday night? The Holy Ghost took over. What happened? Pastor preach, glory to God. <laughs> Woo! Feeling pretty good. Can I get an amen? amen? So anyway, I want us to become more conscious and become more spiritual conscious, which is going to help our prayer life. So I remember when the Lord began to deal with me, you're so conscious of everything. You're conscious of what you said to someone if you hurt their feelings. Because, you know, I, didn't wanna, I never wanted to hurt anybody's feelings. I want everybody to feel loved. I don't want anybody even here pastoring. This is why I've never dreamed about pastoring. I don't want anybody to feel like that pastor doesn't love me. I had somebody come up to me one day and said, uh, I know you don't love me. Uh, where in the world did you get I don't love you? Well, you never, you just don't act like it. Well, <laughs> it's a trip, man. Well, I know you don't love me. Well, I do love you. Well, I know you just don't like things about me. Well, now we're not talking about love. There's some things that could be fixed, yes. But I do love you. I'd help you like I'd help everybody else. I help you like I help everybody else. So, walking with God and being sensitive, what you got to do is become conscious that God's always present. He's present. He's present right now. It bugs when people say, I just don't feel God. Well, what does God feel like? You know, sometimes... Sometimes songs get talking about feeling God, feeling whatever, that people can get so caught up in the feeling side that they don't know how to walk by faith and live in it when there's no feeling. You, you, you got to know how to walk with God when there's no feeling, when there's no goosebumps. Or one preacher I loved, he said, no chicken skin. And little bumps on chicken skin. You got to know how to walk with God when there's no chicken skin. Come on. You've got to know how to walk with God. You, 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 you can't always, you can't always, you're not always going to have a flip and a flop and a twist and a drop. I don't wake, woo, every day. I don't have it every day. Oh. Some days you just keep walking it out by faith. I'm not moved by what I see. I'm not moved by how I feel. I'm not moved by what I hear. I'm moved by what I believe. And I believe God's present. God's a way maker. Amen. He's a present help in a time of need. And I'm in a time of need. So therefore he's present. Hallelujah. 
Now, when the feeling's there, I like it too. But I'm not going to judge my walk on a feeling. Come on. There's some days in tax season with Angel. She's so caught up in that. I don't go around saying, you haven't hardly talked to me. You don't love me no more? <laughs> Come on, you can't just, if you don't always have a sweet fuzzy, you still got to know that God dwells in me. Yes. I just finished a biography on Benjamin Rush, one of the signers of the Declaration. One of great doctors helped forge medicine in America. And uh, some of his final words were, in him I live, and in him I move, and in him I have my being. So you got to know, you got to have some positional consciousness about you. I'm not just here. I'm not just in this hell. I am in him, and in him I live, and in him I move, and in him I have my being. If he is healing, then in healing I live, and in healing I move, and in healing I have my being. If he is prosperity, and in prosperity I live, and in prosperity I move, and in prosperity I have my being. And in him is comfort, then in him, in comfort I live, in comfort I move, in comfort I have my total being. In him is righteousness, and in righteousness I live, I move, and I have my total being. Come on. If, if Jesus was the fullness of the Godhead bodily, the Bible says in Colossians, he is the fullness of the Godhead in bodily form. And now the Bible says, in him I live. I move. I just go ahead and just step on in him. Come on. I've stepped into trouble. I've stepped into weariness. I've stepped into, you know, pain. But I choose today. I'm just going to step on in him. And now in him I live. And in him I move. In him I have my being. Well, what do you do when things get really loud around you, Pastor? I scream. <laughs> yeah, that's what I do, Pastor. No, no, no. You got to ask me, what do I scream? Because your head goes crazy. I've yelled real loud. Turn my mic off. <laughs> Shut up! Yeah, that's right. Nobody's around. But I'm telling this. Mm -hmm. You shut up. You shut up. Amen. You shut up. Yes. Right. You shut up. You don't have a voice in this. You don't have a voice in this. Angels attacking her body, and I did this, and hear her say it the other day, just bless me. I said, hey, how are you feeling? She says, well, if I ask my body, it's going to tell me not very good. But I went to the Word, and the Word says I'm healed, so uh, I say I'm healed. I just said, oh, I love that kind of talk. <laughs> just telling you. There's just something about that kind of talk I love. Because we're not denying fact. We're just allowing truth to supersede the fact. You compelled me to go here. But you are God's garden. Yes. And he's got something beautiful planned yes. to grow in your life. Yes. Something beautiful planned to grow in your life. Right. And we're going to become God conscious about this. Yes. Oh, I want to talk about that, but I, I want us to stand.